it now falls me, to me a great pleasure to introduce our closing keynote speaker, um, who he, by his very existence on the program has kept you all here despite the snow. Um, so I'm very happy to have him here. Actually, we've been planning to have David Willits here for many a year, although he doesn't know it. Um, whenever we were planning this conference, the R2R conference, or even before that, the ASA conference, somebody would say, who's that um, MP who's sort of to do with science and stuff? You know, the really clever bloke. And then somebody said, you mean Frank Field? And they go, no, no, not him, the other guy. And so finally, I was at a, a, a meeting uh, that David was at, and he was talking about the Resolution Foundation work that he's doing, which is about um, giving money from old rich people to young poor people, which, as you've seen from the previous photographs, was the father of two boys in their 20s, I absolutely oppose. Um, but I, I kind of grabbed him before he could escape and said, we've always wanted you to, to speak to us. And he, in a moment of weakness, I think we'd all drunk a fair bit, um, in a moment of weakness, agreed. And so we're very happy to have him here. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, in a moment, invite him up on stage to speak to you until uh, basically just about 4.30 when I'm just going to wrap us up. Um, if he leaves time for questions, I'm going to invite him to just run questions. There'll be microphone people if, if he wants to do questions. And then I will uh, shoot him with my crossbow if he overruns. And that's the whole plan. So I'm going to ask you to welcome Lord Willits, please. Thank you very much, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm sorry to be running a few minutes late, and uh, I will try to keep my remarks down to time so that there is time for you to make comments and ask questions. Uh, and I'm particularly sorry that I missed Mark's famous summary of the all the proceedings of the conference and all the key issues that you've covered. So I don't have the benefit of having heard that. And it'll, I don't know whether what I'm going to say now is completely off kilter with what he said as the summary and what you've been discussing. But I'd like to begin with identifying some of the key trends which are reasons for optimism. And that's because I'm going to end with Brexit, which is not a reason for optimism. <laughs> But let's start with the, the best bits and um, some of the environment in which you as researchers and communicators and publishers of research are operating. First of all, um, and as I said, I will end up with Brexit, but in a, in a so social and cultural environment where there's a kind of cacophony of opinion, uh, the value of any kind of evidence and argument that is empirical, based on evidence, and rigorous and rational, is greater than ever. And indeed, if we're to try to find any common ground as all these different disputes carry on around us, that appeal to evidence and reason is crucial. So the values that our academic community and our publishing community stands for uh, from uh, academic rigor through to peer review are incredibly valuable at a time like this. So what you guys do matters. Uh, and then, it's not just that it matters, wearing now my hat as a member of the board of UKRI, one of the things that we are most pleased about is that we've also had a commitment from the government to increase national spending on research and development from about 1.7% of GDP, which is where it is now, to 2.4% of GDP. That brings us up to at least something like the OECD average, though it's very possible by the time we reach 2.4%, the OECD average will have got even higher, and we're gonna keep on going. But that is a fantastic kind of vote of confidence in R&D across the UK. Now, it does, of course, include private spend and public spend. And it's not actually new that Gordon Brown, when he was chancellor in about 2004, announced the aim of getting to 2.4%. And we've done a historical study as to why that didn't work, because he got, made no progress whatsoever towards it. And one of the reasons that we didn't make progress towards it was the Treasury had a grossly exaggerated view of the amount of that extra spend that would come from the private sector and underestimated the role of the public sector. And science, research, R&D is undoubtedly an area 
where public spend crowds in private spend rather than crowding out private spend. So we clearly have to have a sensible, credible ratio of public spend and private spend. And inevitably, it means that one thing we do, and we have UKRI is absolutely committed to curiosity-based research, but one thing we have to do is look at forms of research, public funding for research, that will also leverage and attract private investment as well. But nevertheless, we are on a journey where R&D spend in the UK is rising and should rise further. Um, and while I'm sticking with the kind of optimistic message, uh, something else that I should cite, and I think that, that it's an organization represented here at this conference, something I always found fascinating when I was a minister was the Elsevier cobwebs, the, the distribution of research excellence in different countries according to disciplines. Um, and, you f and there was something very striking about the, the British cobweb that I hope most of you are familiar with. That whereas when you, looked at when you looked at France or Germany, you got a clear sense of very distinctive strengths and other areas of enormous weakness. So it's no secret, I mean, Germany, fantastic on uh, engineering. France, fantastic on maths, uh, Italy very strong in physics, but equally other areas, it, not in, for example, the humanities or the social sciences, but, not other, but also sometimes others, generally not particularly strong in life sciences, these were cobwebs that had a very skewed shape. The British cobweb by comparison, measuring the performance of our research between different disciplines, showed a much more even distribution of excellence across a very wide range of disciplines. And one of, the, uh, one of my nightmares as minister, I know occasionally when you think it's about to happen, but we managed to avoid it, would be a moment of truth when you were told for a medium-sized economy, we can't afford this distribution of excellence, we're gonna to have to specialize. But actually, the UK strength is precisely that we are excellent in so many different disciplines. And there are often discussions about what should we focus on, what are we best at, how do we strike the right balance between different disciplines. And in my mind, the most important single feature of UK research is precisely that we have excellence in so many different areas, and that really matters nowadays. When you look at the debates on cutting edge science and technology, uh, it's absolutely clear that those debates involve drawing on the resources of ethicists, historians, people who are uh, anthropologists, psychologists. Um, I've been, I, have, I have had se been at serious discussions and seminars where people have regarded one of the biggest constraints on the expansion of AI, the lack of people who can think through the ethical issues in AI. So we clearly actually need to continue to invest in a very wide range of disciplines and the UK has an extraordinary position as a medium-sized economy with such a broad range of expertise. And this is important because there is always a kind of primitive reductionism. You get kind of STEM subjects are the source of value, the rest are a luxury. And uh, it's, that is not the case. All disciplines have something to contribute. And it's fascinating. There's recently been an exercise across government and Whitehall identifying the research questions that those departments would like to have tackled and addressed in order to deliver their public service responsibilities. And I think there have been about 700 research topics identified across Whitehall a very high proportion of them draw on and require strength in social sciences, for example. So we don't just live in a world where STEM is the future and everything else is uh, expendable. That's not the case. So that's another reason for optimism. So we've got a, we've got a growing budget. We are strongly, uh, we've got a strong distribution across many disciplines. And also, this is a very exciting time as the data revolution reaches and uh, spreads across the research community. And again, Britain has got some distinctive strengths, historic data sets, some very strongly curated data sets, 
Um, we've got, I remember going on a, on a visit to New York with the then mayor of London, Boris Johnson. Those were the days we were going off to look at how we could link UK life sciences and US life sciences. And we brought, we had some Lon leading London medical researchers, and this is the right building in which to make this point, with us, including some geneticists visiting New York. And it was absolutely clear that the kind of research that was possible in London, linking genetic data, patient data, social data, of course with the right protections and confidentiality, but at least that research was possible. The New York researchers just did not see how they could possibly attain the kind of data sets that our researchers thought they could access. And they were talking about the fact that people had medical treatments in different centers and they weren't linked and they hadn't got anything, got very little information about their childhoods or there was a trade in social security numbers. So that when you thought, when you got the social security number and thought you know something about the person, social security number didn't actually capture the identity of the person they're really dealing with. It, the, those kind of data linking challenges defeated them, but in the UK, it was possible to imagine how we could overcome them. So we've also got a strength on data, and that stands us in good stead. There are inevitably issues around access to that data and protecting its confidentiality. And if I may say so, getting closer to the, some of the themes you've been talking about, also issues around access for the purpose of assessing the reproducibility and reliability of research data. Even for me, as a lay consumer of research materials, um, let, um, let me share with you my, the kind of frustrations you have. Uh, how many footnotes with a URL when you think you're going to access the supporting research or documentation that sustains the rather interesting assertion in the main document, you find the URL doesn't get you anywhere. You find the web page is inaccessible or closed down. I saw one piece of research that said 14% of all footnotes now were non functioning for those sorts of reasons. That makes it harder for people to follow through and understand the foundations on which research has rested. And similarly, the requirement that the data that underpins a research uh, uh, article should be in some sense accessible. And of course, that's, one of the, that's part of the value that our academic publishers add. But how often is there some special source, specially written code that the researcher has constructed that you can't access in order to understand exactly how the data has been used or do you find that the original data sets are themselves inaccessible? So there are things which the research community as part of a commitment to research integrity needs to deliver which is not always available for us who wish to access research. That leads me on to now some of the controversies which I ought to touch on, and of course one is open access. Uh, and I commissioned Janet Finch's uh, original report on all this, and uh, I am an unashamed believer in gold open access. I think that it is part of the part of now an inherent part of a research project that it should include the costs of communicating that research project if, it, if it's publicly funded in a way that makes it accessible to uh, uh, as many people as possible from the beginning. So that's the kind of point of principle from which I start. Um, I'm pragmatic on implementation. Disciplines differ. It's clear that if you are uh, doing work from trying to interpret data generated at CERN, you work at a speed and within, an, within a culture that is very different than a historian or a literary critic publishing in a journal or even more in a monograph. So disciplines differ, uh, but I continue to believe that gold is a is the right principle, and green is also a mechanism, though I've always instinctively, personally preferred gold to green. Uh, but there were risks in the journey that we embarked on six years ago now. Um, is there a first mover advantage or a first mover disadvantage was one of my concerns. Going first, did it just mean that we were giving away all our research to people around the world without any similar response and access? Uh, and I certainly had 
I can remember the dinners and the discussions with ministers across the EU, for example, trying to persuade them of the value and significance of what we were doing. Um, plan S, regardless of the exact controversy around it, Plan S at least has the advantage that no longer is the UK on its own. Now this is an issue that is being confronted by many of the world's leading scientific nations, and a good thing too. Um, the other issue, of course, that worried me from the beginning was exactly what the costs would be and where the costs would fall um, and whether article processing charges and whatever, how high they would become. Um, and there clearly has been a cost issue. Um, and it's very important that we tackle that whilst maintaining the viability of the academic publishing community. Um, and so the position of UKRI is that we think that Plan S is a, a, a valuable exercise that could map out a, tradition, a transition to open access, but there is, of course, to be a, uh, a, there is a review and a consultation to ensure that the UK goes ahead in a way that works for us and uh, takes us on that journey without our losing key parts of our research environment and our research community. Um, let me mention a, a few of the other issues that we are, uh, the trade-offs, the dilemmas that we wrestle with at UKRI and then end up on Brexit. So the UKRI is a, look at what we are, I would say the top two issues on the agenda for us at the moment are Brexit and the CSR. And how we approach the CSR is enormously important. As I said, we've got to have a credible path to getting to 2.4%. And it raises a whole series of questions about the distribution and priorities in the UK public research budget. But the one thing is at least we are approaching those in an environment where resource is rising and trade-offs are so much easier to make in your environment, if you're in an environment where total resource is going up than in, your, in an environment where it is flat or even falling. So one balance is responsive versus strategic funding. It's very important we keep responsive mode funding. We can't have a grand strategy that tries to dragoon the entire UK research community into pre-identified uh, research priorities. But equally, in the past, there probably wasn't enough strategy. So getting the right balance between responsive node and strategic, and in turn, whether strategy is entirely captured by challenges. I think challenges have added something to our research community, and I think they've spiced up our research funding. But in my view, challenges are only one part of a picture. When I look back to the, the way in which industrial strategy was delivered in the coalition, it tended to end up with uh, David Cameron in number 10, very excited by challenges, um, antimicrobial resistance, uh, tackling Alzheimer's. Uh, George Osborne and the Treasury, George in particular, very focused on place. Where is the research activity happening? How can we offer a better deal to the North? Uh, probably for Vince, my colleague, friend with whom I enjoyed working, Vince, who was a bit of a petrol head really, liked industrial sectors, particularly automotive, aerospace, sector deals where the UK government engaged. And for me, as the science minister, for me, uh, it was, uh, uh, when it came to industrial strategy, it was technologies that mattered. The long journey of a general purpose technology from the research lab to the marketplace, where historically in Britain, the government disengaged too soon expected commercial investors to take far more risk than they were expected to take in other countries, and we then kind of beat up on ourselves that we were somehow risk averse. When we weren't risk averse, we were expecting them to take too much risk. So I concluded there was a bigger responsibility for government in supporting technologies. Put all that together, and you can alter the mix as you wish, but put all that together, challenges, places, sectors, technologies, and then I think you've got a mix that adds up to an industrial strategy of which UKRI can be the custodian. We've got also to balance project funding with promoting capacity, 
promoting the capacity so that in universities remain financially viable, whatever Orga may do to them, and also to ensure that we continue to have the physical infrastructure that is needed in order to discharge research. There's an interesting trade-off between research in universities and in other institutions. In my book, A University Education, available on Amazon, you will find the figures that show how unusual the UK is with the concentration of research activity in a university environment relative to the perilous, risky life of being in a public sector research establishment. If there is extra money, what about an enhanced role for PSREs? Have we got that, you know, can, would we expect in the environment of growing resource to have more research outside a university environment? Um, and also, of course, inevitably upstream and downstream. I know innovation is far more intricate than that, but the balance between the research councils and Innovate UK. I think Innovate UK, formerly the TSB, has a crucial job and has tended to suffer uh, in comparison with the research councils, but Innovate UK is also very important. So those are the type of policy issues that we're wrestling with, with you in UKRI, obviously uh, working with ministers and aiming at the CSR. Let me end in the last few minutes about, uh, on Brexit. And because Brexit, all this, what the real, the real kind of indulgence of the last quarter of an hour is I've talked as if we're in a basically rational world where domestic policy can carry on advancing the UK research base and we can work out the right, think of the right uh, balance of science funding, we can uh, uh, focus on uh, open access, uh, we can engage with the excitement of the data revolution. But Brexit looms over all of it. Um, and I think Brexit is a massive risk to our research base. Uh, it would be catastrophic if we left the EU without a deal. Uh, and I know that many friends and former colleagues of mine in government absolutely hold that view and will do their best to ensure that we do not leave with no deal. And I'm confident, talking to my friends still in the Commons, that there is a majority that will protect the UK economy from Brexiting without a deal. Uh, if there is a deal, it has to be as close an engagement with the EU as possible. And obviously, participation in Horizon Europe and other initiatives is very important for us. And at the moment, nothing is guaranteed. The, it's very hard to engage in these type of conversations with people in Brussels until we have an agreed framework for our exit. But it's a matter of urgency for us now to, to join in those discussions and the good news is that most of the people engaged in science policy and innovation policy in Brussels want the UK to remain involved and many of the national academies absolutely want the UK to remain involved and press their national governments to make the case for the UK to be involved. It would be lose-lose if we lost those connections but that is still a battle to be fought. And meanwhile, what I observe, and I have to say, uh, I say it, um, it is just, I think, necessary, regardless of how desirable one thinks it, what I observe is the massive amount of effort now being put into bilateral links. Uh, and looking at the range of institutions that you represent. In the past, we used to think, well, the EU and our participation in the EU was kind of taken for granted, and the external links activity involves exactly what connections we have with India or China or the US or Canada. Now, a lot of effort has to go into promoting bilateral and mo multilateral links with individual European states. It's a matter of linking research establishments between the UK and parallel researchers across the remaining EU. It's a matter of universities suddenly looking for partnerships and creating research institutes and uh, uh, research bases on the continent. And you can't just set up a post box where you receive the EU check and then bring it back to the UK. The EU will play hardball. They will want to see evidence of real research activity happening in the EU. So clearly a main activity that people have to focus on is building those kind of bilateral links. Uh, I hope that at the end of, the, at the end of this, uh, we will not do too much damage to the UK research base, but it is not straightforward, either for academic staff, for research collaborations, for the attraction of um, overseas students. But I hope 
that the UK, with its history of collaboration with other European countries, will be able to emerge from Brexit without too much damage done. I'm sorry to end on that rather tepid note, but it seems to me to capture the reality of Brexit, and I just look forward to the day when the domestic agenda that I was outlining to you earlier is one that we can all concentrate on again. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much indeed. Well, I think, Mark, we have now got about 10 minutes for comments and questions, if anybody. If you could identify yourself, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Mark Allen. Thank you, David, very much. I wonder if you could just, as you talked rightly about, about the optimism that you see, both in discipline spread, in the increase in, in R&D funding, and the solidity of, of, of institutions, can you put that into, and it might be an observation now, rather than you being engaged in it, in the broad trend of funding for higher education as a whole? And, <laughs> and particularly, whether that funding should support centers of excellence in research in the Russell Group, and, ah. maybe, and, and perhaps yeah. begin to map out a slightly different landscape yeah. between research and teaching yeah. than the one that was the agenda for the previous 20 years. Yeah. Well, um, I continue to believe that the, I mean, those, those are very telling questions. Um, two comments. First of all, although university funding is intricate, the overall picture as I saw it has been that by and large, um, the arts disciplines, fee income from the arts disciplines has tended to cross-subsidize physical sciences and life sciences. And revenues from overseas students have tended to be used to help fund research, where there's not all the research, well, very little of the research comes with full cost funding included, so you'll have to find something extra to make it viable, and the income from the overseas students cover that. Now, it's a gross simplification, but that's a reasonable starting point. Um, if we end up with the tuition income for universities falling, which I think would be a mistake, but it might happen, if that happened, then the inc re revenues from overseas students would instead be diverted to subsidizing the costs of the domestic students, and the losers would be the research base and research funding. So that is, my, that is the, an obvious danger in today's environment. And, uh, and it's something that's very important to all of us on the research. So you would paradoxically find that it was the research side that lost out from a set of decisions, quite possibly taken in a, de in a department that doesn't even have research amongst its responsibilities. That's the risk. And I think it's a risk that we have to ensure everybody is aware of, first point. Second point, there is... A, on the journey from one point, or, or I have endlessly had conversations over the years with people who think Russell Group equals good university, non-Russell Group equals bad university. And of course, this is the place to report that because the Russell Group, named after the Russell Hotel, just down the road, where the research-intensive universities with medical schools used to meet before they came into the BMA. That is the origin of the Russell Group. So the... It, uh, and my view is that, of course, there is research excellence for which you've got metrics, but there are other ways in which you can really contribute to UK research, even if it's not in the form that, of highly cited articles in the most prestigious journals. Uh, if you are on a journey from 1.7% to 2.4%, you need more people doing more research in more places. You can't, if it's a growth agenda, and you can't deliver a growth agenda with a concentration focus. And another tension is I think the people on the te university teaching side think they know what the good universities are, I'm not sure they have the empirical evidence, but think they know what the good universities are and want to concentrate everything on them, when on the research side you just can't get to 2.4% unless you've got more universities delivering doctoral programs, you've got more universities doing research, even if it's applied research and not always prestigious, you just need to have it happening in more places. Um, and so there is a danger from the teaching agenda to research, but the research voice matters 
in Whitehall and in the media, and I'd encourage anybody who has that, has those conversations to get those messages across. On from that, while people think of their questions, um, do you see any virtue? I mean, in America, there are undergraduate teaching institutions which have a fantastic reputation. Do you see virtue in the UK in having excellent teaching non-research universities as in that system or maintaining our kind of current really just two-tier model? Uh, I, I think it is. I can envisage teaching like that, uh, at, at an institution like that. Um, but I had a, a couple of caveats. First of all, even if it's not doing cutting edge research, it has to have cutting edge scholarship. And the American liberal arts colleges have, have cutting edge scholarship. You, want, you need to be taught by someone. That's what is distinctive about a university, is being taught by people who are operating at the frontiers of their discipline and are familiar with the latest research and are therefore uh, up to date and engaged, even if they are not necessarily actually publishing research themselves. And second point, and I have to say this is one of my disagreements with um, a uh, policy agenda that Nick Stern pressed. In the last ref, some of the, research, some of the Russell Group research intensive universities objected to what they regarded as gaming of the system with some universities very selectively only submitting some researchers to the ref. So one thing that Nick Stern proposed in his review of the ref was that all research active academics should be submitted to the ref. My view is that this is in danger of creating a monoculture of what constitutes useful, valuable, excellent research. There will be universities that aren't massively research active, but have got a, an economics department which, for example, studies the regional economy, applies current economic understanding to the study of the regional economy. That is a kind of research. It's not just teaching. It's a kind of research. It's not going to get you published in the economic journal. It's not going to score you a very high ranking in the ref, but it's bloody useful. And there's a lot of research activity where we shouldn't be troubled by the fact that it doesn't score excellence on the citation um, field-based indices of, the, of Elsevier and others, but is still useful for the community and worth doing and is not the same as teaching. I mean, it's very important we protect that kind of research. And there are many universities that aren't doing the prestigious journal research that are nevertheless doing that sort of research, and we should treasure it. Yeah. Anthony Watkins in um, cyber research. I'm afraid we can't really let you go without saying something about Plan S. I'm sorry about this, but mm. it's obvious. I just want to say, in preparation for your reply, that I've heard presentations by both Robert Jan Smith and David Sweeney, I'm sorry to say, um, saying that basically Plan S is based upon the failure of the Finch process. What do you say to that, sir? Okay. Yeah, I, I think that the, the problem that we had with the implementation of Finch was that there was not the funding to deliver gold to scale. Gold has spread, and I'm pleased about that. Um, but the, and you can reasonably argue it's an inherent part of the research process, uh, but especially given what's happened to article processing charges, it's been very hard for universities and other research institutes to find the resource for gold. And at the same time, uh, the cost of subscribing to uh, journals has kept on rising, so there hasn't really been an offsetting saving in university library costs. So what I think that Plan S is trying to do is, that's why it's a, is to manage that transition, is to shift more radically to proper funding for gold with the expectation that there is actually a genuine saving in the costs of subscriptions to journals as a result of large-scale gold. And I think that it should be seen as an attempt to get through the transitional barriers in that journey. Lady there, yeah. Uh, hi, Amy Price from the Publishers Association. Uh -huh. um, 
I, w I won't continue on the Plan S vein too intently, but you did make a really interesting comment about commercial organisations not being asked to take on risk mm. for government policy. And so I was wondering if you could apply that to open access and ask you how UKRI can better support and encourage providers, not just publishers, but all providers in this space, how UKRI can encourage them to be more innovative in finding access solutions, so going beyond existing models. Um, well, we are consulting. UKRI, uh, uh, is, I have no executive responsibility there, but UKRI is consulting on this, and if you have thoughts about it, um, now is a very good moment to put them in. I, I would say that the, the, going back to the select committee's report on science integrity and the um, reproduce, the worry about the reproducibility of results. If, if, I was, if I was trying to make the case for the organizations you represent and show how they contribute value, it does seem to me that one important point is that data does not just organize itself in a form that makes it accessible to others. The code in order to analyze the data does not automatically become available. The, the curation, custodianship, accessibility itself adds value. And the, anything that puts publishers on the side of the angels in that kind of research integrity debate, um, I think would be a considerable con um, sort of contribution to the science community and would I think would be, would be very relevant and apposite at the moment uh, because as well as the kind of the quite simply, you know, wrong faking of results and faking of material, there's quite a lot in a grey area where it's just hard to see exactly how the research was done, it's hard to see exactly how it's reproducible, it's hard to access exactly what was done by the researcher beforehand. All that is a real obstacle to progress and um, publishers helping remove those obstacles, I think would be fantastic. Yes, at the back, the very back, yeah. Um, this is Rob, Robert Harrington from the American Mathematical Society. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is I just wondered if you have a view on the role of scholarly societies in this ecosystem of research and development in the UK. And the second question is do you have a, a feel for where the relationship with uh, the US might go, given that there are different priorities in terms of funding and so on with the OSTP in the US. Is this, is this something you fear, or do you think it's going to be a, a, you know, embrace what you're trying to achieve? Uh, are you talking about, well, I think this is better be the last one, actually. Mark is looking restless. Um, yeah, the, the learning societies are incredibly important, and indeed I've just become the chairman of the Foundation of Science and Technology. I hope there are people here whose organizations are, are members of the FST and one of the historic roles of the FST has been to represent individual learned societies, not all of which have exactly the same profile as the Royal Society or the, or the British Academy. So they are important and I realize in turn the economics of open access uh, matters for some of those. Uh, and it's definitely something that UKRI is aware of as part of this consultation on Plan S. On the US, um, the U.S. Is, is going to have, uh, I'm not close, to, I, haven't, uh, I don't go to the U.S. as much as I did. I was discussing some of it in Washington recently. Though. The U.S. does need its own domestic agenda for open access and how it's funded. And there are signs that that is at last happening. So the, there's probably going to have to be some kind of U.S.-wide initiative. If you mean more widely what is happening on U.S. science and technology, um, I would say the, the issue that is rapidly rising up the charts is links to China. And uh, I have myself been on the, on the receiving end of, of leading US, representatives of leading US science organizations saying to me, this is since I stopped being the minister, saying um, we are very uncomfortable by the amount of research partnership that you are promoting with China. And if we get, I'm sorry to end on another Brexit note, but if we get into trade links, increased science and exchange links with the US, 
they are going to start putting conditions about what we do with China, which is going to force the UK to face some strategic trade-offs that historically we have avoided, and where I do think we have to say that we are entitled also to have research partnerships with China. We can't stop all that. We, uh, China is a rising power with a massive investment in science and research, and it's far better to engage with it than not to engage with it. But I think that is a looming issue um, as research becomes another arena for US-China competition. And we're going to find ourselves taking some, facing some quite acute dilemmas as a result. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, David. That's wonderful. We're pretty ruthless on timekeeping here, as you know. We could have gone for, on for another six hours if we, if we wanted to, if we could have. Um, right, it falls to me just really to do the final um, wrap-up for just like one minute. Um, so, uh, firstly, um, thank you very much for, for being here with us and for attending the conference. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Please do complete your surveys. I know we bang on about this. Um, this is about evaluating this year, but it's also about guiding us uh, in the future. So things you would like to see in future conferences, things you, you don't want to see, uh, is very valuable information and actually the scoring is great but the comments are, are particularly valuable. Um, some of the questions that you might ask, we've changed the room configuration if you've been here before. We have these lovely half moon tables, uh, we have this stage. Um, that's sort of slightly more friendly than the high BMA stage. I'd be interested in your thoughts as to whether that's worth doing. To give you a sort of feeling for that, this stage here that we're just, um, we're just enjoying, uh, that cost £2,000. So do you feel that's good value for money to be a bit, have the speakers a bit closer to you or not? So that sort of feedback, super interesting to have. Um, uh, see you next year, I hope. Um, that's probably going to be 24th and 25th of February, if that's a Monday and a Tuesday, somebody can check. Um, but I think that's the provisional dates we have in mind. Probably still here, depending a little bit on your feedback. But if we continue to grow, we're starting to outgrow this room unless we change the configuration. So that'll be kind of interesting. So um, we'll see you next year. Or we might see you at Scholarly Social in the pub. Um, so directions to the pub are in your uh, packs. And so various people will be going to the pub. And, and, and also new people who have not been able to come to the conference will probably be there. Um, I will certainly be there in about an hour. Um, so perhaps I'll see some of you there. Uh, but if not, next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>